All right, if everyone is here, um, I'd like to welcome you to the Women Who Submit Submission Conference. Um, let's begin by acknowledging the traditional stewards of the land we are all collectively standing on. We show gratitude to the Tongva people, past and present, for caring for this place that was stolen from them, that we now call Los Angeles. And we vow to help the Tongva gain federal recognition and autonomy. Um, please take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral people and land you are currently on by sharing their names in the chat. Thank you everyone for acknowledging the ancestral stewards of your land. Um, all right, so welcome to the Women Who Submit Submission Conference. Sponsorship for this event comes from Natalie Diaz and the Arizona State University Center for Imagination in the Borderlands. In this hour, we are hosting the panel, Editors Share Best Practices for Submission. Our panelists are Muriel Leong, Cassandra Lane, and Raina Leong. And our moderator is Ramona Pilar. Um, my name is Lauren Edgar Crow. I'm an organizer with Women Who Submit, and I'll be your tech host for this hour. So if you have any technical issues or questions, you can message me privately um, or putting, put them in the chat function. If you have any questions for our panelists, you can write them in the Q&A section and the moderator, Ramona, will pick a couple for the panel to answer toward the end of the hour. And feel free to send positive reactions, gifts, support, uh, feedback in the chat, anything you'd like. We'd love to see people talking back and forth and responding. And we're happy to have you all here. Um, so on that note, I will be hiding my video, um, but I'll still be watching and taking care of tech stuff. And Ramona, I'll let you take it away. Hello, good afternoon, party people. Um, welcome to the Women Who Submit Conference. This is the panel on magazine and journal editors sharing their best practices. Um, I am moderating today. My name is Ramona. A bit about me, I've been involved with Women Who Submit um, on and off for a good, good chunk of years, and um, I'm really excited to be talking to editors today, right? Because a lot of what we do is trying to get through those um, blocks and get through gatekeepers and now the way that we can do that is to become them ourselves we're not gatekeepers but you know what I mean well people up here doing the things getting it done <laughs> so I'm very to talk today to I will introduce our panelists Cassandra Lane is the author of We Are Bridges coming out from Feminist Press in 2021 and is the winner of the Louise Merriweather Book Prize and managing editor of LA Parent her stories have appeared in the Atlanta Journal Constitution and Writers Resist, Expressing Motherhood, Fury, the New York Misconception Series. She is an MFA alum of Antioch, as am I. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our next panelist is Reina Leon, PhD, excuse me, and yes, is, and she is the author of three collections of poetry, Canticle of Idols, Boogeyman Dawn, and Sombra, Dislocate, and the chat books, Profeta Without Refuge, um, Ar Areto, and Atabe, Essays on the Mothering Self. She's the editor of the Ascentos Review. She's a full professor of education at St. Mary's College, California, only the third black professor and first Afro-Latina to achieve yes and. Okay, and our third panelist is Muriel Leung. She's the author of Imagine Us, Arm forthcoming from Nightboat Books and Bone Confetti, which is fantastic and amazing. Winner of the 2015 Noemi Press Book Award. 
Her writing can be found in Cream City Review, Earth Coast, Ecologist, Fairy Tale Review, and others. She is a recipient of Fellowship to Pokemon, Vona Voices Workshop, and the Community of Writers. She is the poetry co-editor of Apogee Journal. We give them some love side of the screens. Thank you all for being here. So uh, let's get going. First up, let me get my notes. Okay. So um, I'd just like for each of you to talk about um, the journals that you currently manage and or edit and describe the focus. So um, we'll go ahead and start with Cassandra. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Ramona. I love your energy. So I brought a couple of the magazines. This is a this is Ellie Parent magazine. It is a print and digital magazine here in Los Angeles. It is almost 40 years old. I've been uh, serving as managing editor of the magazine for the last three years. And it's all about the subhead is smart, connected, fun. And it's all about connecting families to in LA to a variety of resources, education and information. It's a monthly magazine. During the, the pandemic, it has halted all printing for the last five months, um, but it is still digital every month. Uh, we cover everything from health and wellness, medical advice to community news. So anything that's, I love, you know, community stories, um, whether it's highlighting a teenager, a family, an author, this is kind of where our introduction to um, books go, a lot of YA books, a lot of books about parenting. Um, we have a chat room Q&A where we feature just people doing really cool stuff from an astronaut to, you know, these two, two moms who own um, an ice cream truck. Um, so that's where all of those community type stories go. We also do food stories in our monthly family recipes column. Um, I love food and I love hearing how chefs came to food and what their, what their stories are behind their recipes. And then we have a series of about five to six features that run every month. Um, and there are some loose things to, to each month. For instance, we're working right now on the back to school issue. Um, but there are other, you know, there are fun issues, summer issues. Um, there is a travel magazine that's on hold right now called Beyond LA. Um, we are, we try to be as inclusive as possible. There's an inclusive LA uh, for families of all abilities. There are a variety of columns and then something that I created that I love called Date with LA and it's all about picking a corner of LA and patronizing businesses, art, etc. and loving on LA. And it's about parents getting out without the kids. So that's LA Parent. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to Lauren for putting the links in the chat room. If you kind of want to check it out um, as we're talking, um, there'll be nice tidbits in there. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, Reina Leon, would you like to tell, tell us a little bit about the Essentials Review? Yeah, I'm so excited to be with you all. Um, and I, I, I love hearing about like all that we're bringing. And so it's a really great honor to, to be joined, joining you all. Um, so the Census Review started in 2008, um, so 12 years old. Um, I uh, co-founded, my co-founder, Alia Lucero, um, edited with me for a few years, but I've been the driving force for that 12. Um, at this point, we have published over 800 Latinx voices um, across um, languages, um, identities, regions, all, all, all the diversity of the Latinx community, and that's our purpose is the whole space for the publication and pro uh, promotion of Latinx artists. Um, and so we're as likely to publish a poem or series of poems as we are to have um, a piece of, um, uh, of a play published or a, uh, a musical um, excerpt or um, a video that's on our website as well. Um, all coming back um, to a literary component, but um, really expansive in what our, um, what our, our lenses are, what our aesthetics are. And that's one of the things that I love about the Aceptas Review is, is having um, seen it over these 12 years and being like, like the Latinx community we, of artists and writers and musicians and performers and like all these things that we do, translators, is just so immensely vibrant. Um, and so to be able to hold space for that flourishing, that 
um, that flowering uh, is an incredible, incredible gift. Um, so I, I currently um, am editing with uh, Lupe Mendez, who came on as associate editor uh, a little bit of uh, about a year ago. And we have an issue coming out August 15th um, that was edited by Rosebe Rosebud Benoni. Um, and I'm really excited about that. Um, and, and it's the first issue actually in 12 years where I've actually been just your friendly neighborhood webmaster <laughs> rather than like doing everything. Right? So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to also developing those partnerships over time. That's great. That's fantastic. Wow. I love your energy. And I'm pretty excited about this coming up August 15th. So everybody mark that down. Yeah. Okay. Muriel, tell us a little bit about poetry. Um, sorry, Apogee. Sorry, I was on the, the panel earlier. So I've got that stuck in my head. You're the poetry editor of Apogee. Tell us more. Yeah, no problem. Um, I think like similar to you know, like being part of a journal, um, like that's been operating for several years. I mean, I came into Apogee five years ago, but it's been about a decade long of work by people who came before me. The Apogee Journal, our basic mission is to publish and uplift voices from the margins. Um, that's what you know Apogee refers to. And it started off as um, a group of Columbia MFA students of color who wanted to start a journal that published um, voices that were like rarely seen in publishing. Um, to have the experience of editing and having an editing experience with a writer of color where you don't have to explain yourself or you don't have to decipher or translate um, or make palatable something that like white audiences like should be doing the effort to like understand. So um, that's the origins of it. And since then we've evolved and we've had, you know, um, new editors come in and out and um, we do like responsive folios that are, you respond to immediate or urgent events, but we also publish, uh, we started off as a print journal and now we've transitioned to an online journal um, on a subscription model. So um, we encourage uh, memberships that will support the running of our journal. Um, and we're always striving to really have these conversations about what does it mean to um, be really um, attuned to the changing conversations about identity politics. What does it mean to publish um, widely, read widely, and how do we have really important political and aesthetic conversations um, about uh, the work that we do so that um, we're not always just, you know, I've been a poetry editor for several years, but since then the poetry team has changed drastically. And so we're always talking about hierarchy in the journal. So how do we, I think when an editor has been in a position for that long, we always need to sort of transition and sort of really question the amount of power we have in that position. So a lot of us play different roles in the organization. Some of us like switch into grant writing, some of us go into event planning or programming. Um, and so that's some of the ways that we've worked. Um, and that's with Apogee Journal. Um, I am also the editor-in-chief of Goldline Press which is through USC. Um, Goldline Press is diff different because it's university based um, and it's part of the PhD program in creative writing and literature. So there is a rotating staff of editors every single year. And um, this year I am the editor in chief. Next year there'll be someone different, which is a great professionalization opportunity for graduate students to have. Um, but it also then changes the nature then of like how we work too. Um, we do a chapbook. We do a chapbook contest every year in poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. And I think what's really special about that is that the chapbook is something that I think doesn't really get its due credit. I would say in publishing, I think there's a lot of emphasis on full-length book manuscripts, but a chapbook is great for um, I think like writers who are you know newer into publishing, and as well as writers who've been in it for longer, but have a very specific work that's like thematically organized and that like fits a chapbook length model and wants to get that work out and we produce that um, through the contest. So that is something that is going on right now and the deadline is August 15th um, and we have really amazing judges uh, for across genres. Um, Cindy Clemens, Marcel Hernandez, Hernandez uh, Castillo and um, Trace, uh, Trace Anderson. 
Yeah. Oh, I think Mona might have gotten kicked off line just a bit. Yeah, we lost the host for a little bit. All right, stand by for a moment <laughs> to make sure I might, I wonder if I need to let her in. Um, sorry about that. Oh, okay. Yay, she's returning. While Ramona's coming in, I just saw a question um, about Raising Mothers. Uh, I forgot to talk about that, <laughs> that I edit for Raising Mothers, which is a journal that highlights the voices of femme and non-binary um, parents of color. Um, and Charissa DeGroote um, founded it a few years back. And uh, from her own experience of like, I'm in the Netherlands and I need some, some some help like, to understand my experience of being a black mother um and uh and so she started the journal the um online publishes across um uh, uh genres as well as well uh as some um threaded essays or, or columns um there's actually a workshop coming up um and so there there are uh, workshops that the raising mothers is starting to offer um too that you can, I'll, I'll drop it in the chat as far as the fa Facebook um, for workshops. Uh, and I love that piece of being able to be in partnership um, with uh, Journal, be an editor for the poetry section, but there are several other editors um, envisioning what the work of the journal is um, beyond publication of um, creating spaces for the production of work, generative uh, workshops, um, and what does it mean to support um, writers um, in many different um, ways? So yeah, that's Raising Mothers. I'm back. Okay, technologies. <laughs> okay, so um, the next question I have is, um, as a writer, because you're also writers as well as being, um, you know, editors and whatnot, um, what kind of responsibilities do you see for yourself as a uh, in, in an editor, editorial position? Like, how do you see your roles and what kind of responsibilities do you feel have as an editor? Start. I feel like as a writer, it's my responsibility to bring on other writers. I started in 2017, I knew so many writers and have had so many new writers you know, write for the magazine and I'm committed to beautiful writing no matter what it's about. Um, so I feel ha I have a responsibility to cultivate relationships with writers, known and unknown, and to make the writing as beautiful and accessible as possible. One of the incredible gifts that I, I see myself as being a part of um, is also providing um, encouragement to those folk who um, submit work, you know, as writers, we know the rejection, right? We know what it is to like the crushing, especially when you're just starting out. And I, um, I often, you know, for years, actually for the first seven or eight years of the Ascentive Review, I would give personal feedback on rejection. We can't anymore, we're too big. Um, but I still will try and send out um, uh, invitations to the community to say, okay, well, the, the work wasn't a fit yet, but I, I really want you to send more work. Um, and I, I, I often, sometimes people uh, will receive emails from me, which is like me personally begging <laughs> for them to send more work um, and saying, please, please mention this in your, in your cover letter. Um, and part of that, um, that push and urgency for me is because I know what it is on the other side when you receive that that um, invitation um, and how changing that could be, especially in pandemic times, especially right now where we can feel really isolated because we are, um, and um, and what that can do to us as writers um, and the questioning of are we writers at all and what does this mean and how do I how do I work within this um, how do I live within this um, and I know too what it what it can be to receive that that light that invitation. Um, and, and that 
fostering of community is very much core to everything that the Ascentos Review is about. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it's, it's, it's like, I don't know, as writers, I think we, we have that experience of like, like, especially as newer writers going into literary publishing and feeling so much discouragement and having to sort of learn, learn in many ways through rejection. And so I think being an editor is such a wonderful opportunity to change the way in which it can happen and to encourage um, conversation building relationships. So that like, if a work doesn't get published in a forthcoming issue, it's not necessarily a rejection. It's actually just more of a conversation of like, well, like we're not, um, many writers don't get the kind of feedback if they're not institution, like tied to any institutions or they're not taking workshops or they can't afford workshops and sending work to literature journals may be the only space in which they're getting feedback on the work. So I think that's kind of how I think about, especially work with Apogee is like, I think devoting time to having those conversations and, and anticipating that someone will send work again and hoping that they do because, um, and then like trying to have a good memory of people's work too, so that we can speak to it um, and like help nurture and cultivate that writing um, in the hopes of seeing um, that writing grow. So I think that's more important than like getting a, a person's poem in a journal. It's about sort of the relationship um, that we get to create from that conversation. Is Ramona here? Looks like we, Ramona, are you back? Okay, I'm gonna try this from my phone, apologies. I'm here, yeah. Um, I'm trying this from my phone, apologies. It was working fine earlier. I'm sure you've all had this experience. <laughs> and if not, yeah, okay, no problem. Um, so, um, While you're doing that, Ramona, you. could I add um, one more? So next, if you wouldn't mind describing the publication process for each of your um, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, go ahead. So, oh, there's a little bit of a lag, I'm sorry. So one last thing that I wanted to add was just trying to make sure the writers get paid, um, even though it's not a lot that the magazine pays, just advocating, you know, for higher writer fees, um, following up so that they get paid uh, promptly. Um, if there's an unfortunate kill fee that that goes through. So really, that's something that's super important to me as a writer that when I'm in a, in a position to, you know, advocate for writers just financially in whatever way I can, I have to do that. So. That's awesome. Great. And yeah, those are the kinds of things that like, I mean, um, a lot of submitting is yes, trying to get your work out, but after a certain level, you do want to be compensated for the amount of time and energy you put into your work. So I'm really glad that somebody's, you know, in a position where if you can advocate for that, you do. So that's fantastic. Um, okay, so the, the next question I had was, um, describe the sub submission process for your publication from slush to final selections. If you want to briefly, just so people who um, can get a sense of how that works there, sometimes it's uh, through submittable, which is pretty straightforward, and then sometimes it's, you know, through email. So um, maybe describe your submission process and um, how many rounds it goes through before, um, you know, typically before um, it gets to final decision. I'll start. So we have two ways for, well, three. <laughs> Not a lot of people pick up the phone and call, but I have had pitches over the telephone. It's like, oh my gosh, the phone is ringing, um, <laughs> which is an odd sound sometimes. <laughs> Back in the editorial wings, everything is, you know, email. Um, but we do have a submission form on laparent.com where a person can just fill out the form and pitch that way. Uh, the most common one, I think, is through our, indivi our individual emails. There's just two editors, myself and Christine. And um, so we get pitched constantly. Um, and a lot of times, it's great. We get pitched by writers and we get pitched by public relations agencies. I would say probably, I don't know, 60, 40, um, PR being the heaviest. Uh, so the form online, emails, and then sometimes a call 
and then references, I'll, I'll get re references from writers that I know, um, pitching a writer that they think is really great. Um, yeah, so, and as far as the rounds, Christina and I both cover very specific uh, areas of the magazine. So if she gets a pitch that falls more under my umbrella, she'll forward it my way and vice versa. And uh, we really, because it's such a small staff, there aren't a whole lot of rounds, you know. There are a few pitches where we'll volley it around and just say, hey, what do you think about this if we're not kind of sure about it or if it's kind of different. Uh, but for the most part, we just individually decide, I like this pitch, I like this piece. Uh, there's, there's a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility. Yes, it's articles. Yes, we all have journalism backgrounds, but we're also creative um, thinkers. And so we have published poetry, we have published um, memoirs, short memoirs, short, short first person essays, which is funny because Christina, when I first started three years ago, was not too keen on first person um, and memoir writing. And now she's taking a memoir writing class with one of my former mentors and loving it. So. So I can go next because who knows when the babies are going to fall apart. <laughs> 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 so this is that idea. Um, so for the essential review submission process um, has been um, a pitch we might get through our email, um, but we only review through submittable. Um, and we, we signed on to submittable back when they were just starting. <laughs> so, um, and so we use a lot of the, the, um, the resources there for, oh, wow, that was <laughs> vibrant. That was a shout. She had a contribution. <laughs> to make. So, um, uh, with the essential review, there is no slush. Um, uh, we don't have a, a, another kind of layer of review. I read through everything. Um, and in now with um, Lupe, uh, I do more of the reading for fiction and nonfiction. And um, Lupe Mendez, he will read for poetry um, and sometimes translation. Um, with raising mothers, the submission process is through email, and there's a um, an email on the website, um, and then that goes through um, and is uh, directed. Submissions are directed to the respective editors, so I edit for the poetry. Um, there are some pieces in the edit in the submission process where it's like, oh, that's close. Oh, and here she goes again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are some pieces in the editing process where um, there's more of a conversation of like, oh, this is really close to like what we're trying to um, to form uh, uh, as far as a an arc, an emotional um, arc, um, uh, a, a thematic link, or how the thinking about how whole issue also hangs together. Um, and but I, I want to know more. Another thing is, as far as our submission process that's um, particular with the Essentials Review is we are a journal that focuses on Latinx writers and artists. Um, so that means that folks have to um, complete a statement saying, what does Lat being Latinx mean to you? Because I tell you, one, I think it's because in Poets and Writers, the Essentials Review is at the top. So we get, like, it's an A name, so we <laughs> like, submit things <laughs> that should not submit things because they don't, they are part of different communities, but not ours. Um, so it's very important that they complete that, uh, that statement. I get things that are, are coming from folks who are also in the space of, like, I'm the best. I've been published everywhere. You should publish me. And I'm like, that's wonderful. There are so many other places for you to submit your work. <laughs> and we celebrate you, but not here. So, <laughs> um, so that too is a part of our submission process is really holding true to the submission guidelines. Um, and the same thing for Raising Mothers is like, there isn't a statement for folks to complete, but it is definitely something where I ask people um, if it if um, their identity as being femme or non-binary, parents of color, if that's not clear in some respect, then I'm gonna ask a question um, because the, the community that we're trying to um, hold and hold space for is very particular. Yeah, um, I can speak to what um, Apogee does um, 
to, that's funny, Apache is also the name name too, but I don't think, <laughs> I mean, we got some, we got some things, but also I think, I think what's changed actually is we switched from submittable to CLMP submission manager because I, um, I mean, I'm sure everyone has different experiences with submittable, but I think recently they've changed for, it happened to several small literary magazines where they've changed the pricing model on several journals. And so, you know, we have years of um, data like from, on Submittable and it's a very accessible platform and makes it very easy to read through, but they changed the pricing model on us and we had to make a choice. Like, do we wanna be able to keep paying writers or do we wanna pay like three times as much to keep this database? So we switched over to some um, LMP. And so what the difference is, is that we, Submittable um, lists every like journal that you can possibly submit to that comes through Submittable. And I think that's what happens is that people who just mass send out things will just go through the list. Um, but then CLMP, what we've noticed is we get less, we get less uh, people sending us work, but then it's always from people who um, actually, you know, know the, repu the journal by reputation, um, have read through hopefully the guidelines. Um, and I will say as far as the work that um, we're looking for, I think it differs according to genre. For poetry, I think um, I try to like encourage um, stylistic and aesthetic like diversity. So I don't, um, you know, I think a lot of the poetry editors at this point are very more experimentally inclined. And I think that um, it, you know, there's always, there's always an eye out for innovative work that's like visually like very different, so something we haven't seen before, but there's also, you know, I look for patterns too in the work, if there's like a certain thematic recurrence, like, you know, it's interesting, like, it'll be interesting to see what work comes out during this time, like we have a reading period coming up in, I think, July, um, and I'm interested to know like what people are writing about. And if there's something that keeps coming up, then that's an issue that we can curate around. So I also look for connections between works and to see if um, there are things that go well um, with other things that have been, that people have been sharing. And I also try to, you know, keep in mind that we want, you know, we're not just looking to publish people who are already really established. Um, we also want to have a good balance of people who, you know, have been, in the writing game for a long time are really, you know, active. And then for those who, you know, maybe are less like publicly recognized, but are still, um, but whose work just needs a platform um, to be shared. And so I think being able to publish both side by side, I think you, you kind of help amplify the voices that like do deserve to have a platform. Um, so that's sort of um, the thinking behind Apogee. With Goldline, um, since we're working with chapbook um, manuscript submissions, um, I, I defer a lot to what the genre editors do, honestly. I was a poetry editor last year for Goldline. I think my thought was I wanted to um, make sure that um, there was a, um, because we do judges, um, I want to make sure that we find work that fits the judges aesthetic um, and that's something that it's like they'll have many to choose from that they feel really strongly about um, so this year as editor-in-chief I think I, I wanted to see what the genre editors would choose for their um, for their genres as far as judges and I think that gives an indication of what kind of work um, they want to see so you know, Zinzi Clemens, like um, sensibility would be very different from Mar Marcelo's, it's different from Chase's. And so um, I think that tells me something. And so I let the gen genre editors figure out like how they wanna read and then I'll read alongside them. Um, and then it'll always be a conversation, but ultimately I want the genre editors to feel like they have autonomy over what they choose and have a good record working relationship with the judges too, who will ultimately be making that this final decision. Um, and as far as chapbook manuscripts go, you know, we're looking for, I think generally something that feels very complete, um, that's very cohesive. If there's an idea, I would want it to be, you know, feel like, like strongly formed. There's a very strong vision and a voice for it. It doesn't have to be perfect. I know some people will 
um, email and say like, no, the table of contents, the page numbers are wrong. Can I resend it again? I was like, don't worry about it. If it gets selected, like we'll go through the copy editing process. It's not a big deal. Um, just making sure that the content itself is like um, evocative, um, that's fully thought out and that like, it doesn't have to be perfect because there is an editorial process that you go through to like strengthen some of the work that um, may not be like super clear. So I think some people think that the, the final manuscript has to be really perfect, but I think it just has to have like, um, I think what's most important is a strong voice and vision for the project. Um, and, and, and hopefully something that we've like never seen before. Um, and that like, we like think will be very necessary for people to read in the world. Um, and especially for the chapbook, which I think like, like I, like I said earlier, like doesn't get its due. I'm just like, what chapbooks have we not seen and what would really be great for the world to see at this moment? Um, that's, that's awesome. Um, it actually speaks to a little bit of the different kinds of editorial process you will have, for example, like for a chat book or for a poetry piece or nonfiction or, um, you know, journal, like do, do all three of your, um, do all three of you go through, what, what, what are the kind of editorial processes you go through once you select a piece and continue to work with a writer? Is it extensive? Is it, um, you know, do you want to speak a little bit on that? It can be extensive. And then there are some writers, our A-list writers who require very little editing. Um, so, you know, it, it can be extensive, it can be light editing um, or, and, and barely any editing. Our, I like writers to write about topics that they're passionate about. Yes, we assign stories, but I try, when I'm thinking about assigning a topic, um, I'm thinking about who is going to love this. Um, you know, if it's not a piece that's coming over that's already written. So these are all pitches. Uh, and because I know that that writer is going to be invested in it. And generally, those are the stories that don't need as much heavy editing, which we don't mind. Um, but we're just working, you know, our hands are in so many pots. So it is nice to work with uh, strong writers. Um, and then for pieces that come over already written, Sometimes they're beautiful, sometimes they're, they're just not, you know, we'll send it back to get a little bit more, you know, if it's a, gener a generic type guest column and it's just not hitting, it's not telling a story, that I, I just go back to storytelling and specificity. Um, and sometimes it, it doesn't work, but for the most part, people are open to, to, improving, their, in, to improving their story, to improving their, their writing. I think I've in three years, maybe had one or two writers who were resistant to that. Um, and it was unfortunate for the piece and for the relationship. So uh, a few things around editing. Um, we, we rarely get pitches. So for the Essentials Review or for Raising Mothers, we get things that are submitted with us in mind, right? Um, and uh, Oftentimes, the, the piece itself has struck a chord, has um, caused me to have goosebumps or like to, to learn something new or um, to uh, be challenged in some way in its aesthetics or what it's saying. That strikes, right? And, um, and then it's like, okay, now I've accepted the piece. Or um, it's very rare that I'll accept, um, I'll note like I'd like to accept the piece, but I have these questions or these suggestions around edit. Usually, it's like I trust um, your vision, but also my connection with your vision. So the edits are, are mostly pretty minor. Um, the the times when um, uh, well, I, I should also say this is also very particular about the essential review in that we have had um, instances where a writer or um, someone who's been published within um, the Essentials Review says, oh, I, I just caught this one thing and it just came out like a week ago. We're online, we can change it all, right? Like it's yeah. no, no big deal. Um, so that's a really great thing about being online. If an, an author is like, oh, I, I sent this and you didn't catch it, I didn't catch it, here we go. Um, another thing is that sometimes though being online, there are um, folks who years later, will say, I write totally different now, and I'm a different person. And so please take this thing down that I once had up there. 
I do not want to be seen this way anymore. <laughs> And um, I, I, off, I uh, will we'll push back on that and speak to the, um, the changes, the, the movement of our work, right? And that being important to still represent um, a beginning. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> but there are also some folks, like we, we just recently did this, um, a writer was published in our first issue. It was a really important um, issue, 2008. And, um, they reached out to me and said, you know what, this actually doesn't represent my work right now, but it's also um, um, something um, key to how I, I communicate, how I hold community with my, my um, students, with my youth. And I would actually like this taken down. And so one thing I, I said to that person was, okay, I could hear that, but can you replace that with something else to speak to um, this um, importance of your work, who you were then and who you are now. And that's something, that, that um, evolution, that holding of the, of the writer and community, that too can be a part of your creative process and our work as the Ascentus Review. So I, I offer that example of thinking about the, um, the relationship between the, the writer and the editor as not ending with the publication, right? And the, and that being something that, especially with an online venue, you can actually say years later, um, can we be in relationship about something else? Yeah, really interesting. I find that um, editing, editing like um, helping someone edit like an individual poem is really different from editing like um, a chapbook, which is a little bit more extensive. I find that with Apogee, there's really not many edits to go into the poem once it's accepted. It's kind of like instantaneous, like the poem really speaks, uh, really speaks to us. And then like we're, we always go by unanimous vote or if there is, if there's, if there's something that one editor feels really strongly about, we would have a conversation about it. And oftentimes like, you know, we, we make space for, for every voice um, to be heard. Um, you know, I think in terms of like editing a poem, if there were, if there was a conversation that does come up a lot, it's more, more likely that um, for me personally, I think like poems with easy resolutions is like sometimes uh, like there's, there's like a trend, I think for poems that like are like, you know, have like a uh, viral quality to it, like where there is an easy resolution. And sometimes I want to just push against that a little bit where it's like, I think we, owe it to ourselves to um, do a little bit better with poems that like maybe like resist like easy resolution. So um, like it's a beautiful poem, right? But I think like I want to strive, I want to ask us to strive for something that's more than beautiful. I want it to feel necessary. I want it to feel urgent. Um, I wanted to sort of push against convention. And sometimes that can just be like an edit like, oh, I think if you switch the two last lines, you're going to get something um, even stranger and more compelling. And sometimes it's like a longer conversation about um, just like, what is the objective of the poem? Like, what are you trying to say? I don't, I don't know if you've uh, finished saying what you need to say, but like, if you want to keep working on it, like, well, I can like read different versions of it until you find something that feels right and fitting for you. Um, and so that's the conversation for the poem, for the chapbook. Um, I really love reading um, full length works from writers just because it's like, you can only see so much of someone's individual poem um, of their of their style of their like where they are at that point in their writing career and life. But I think in the chapbook, you get to see like, this is like several years that someone's been working on something. And so you get to say like, wow, this is a good project that like someone put a lot of thought into. And I just want to make sure that I advocate for it and make sure that what they're trying to communicate, it's very clear. A lot of times I think writers struggle with um, ordering poems in a book. And I think that's kind of where like, that's like really essential for feedback. Um, so even if like you're not in, you're not sending your work out, but you're sharing it with friends. I always find that like chapbooks books and full length books, like definitely needs like someone's like second opinion to see about ordering because I think it's just so hard to just know when you're by yourself um, and you're, you live with this project for so long. So I just keep that in mind too. Like I just want, um, I want the 
chop book from start to finish to feel like someone's going through a journey um, and that um, there's like climactic points, there are points of rest, of transition. And then the, by the end, there's a sense of like, like fullness um, at the end. And so I think about like emotional, the emotional journey of reading a chapbook and like how can I um, point out certain things that I've noticed for a writer so that they can make the edits keeping that in mind and they have a lot of agency for how they want to do it and there's a lot of ways it can there's no right way it's just like here's here's my experience reading it and do you want to edit like knowing that a reader might experience that um, and and create a journey for for the reader that's awesome. I mean, I, I love too how you're talking more about the chat book stuff because again, the Goldline Press has their um, opening right now for chat book until August eight, uh, August fifteenth. I think it's the chat book um, open for chat book submissions. Um, everybody who's there, I'm also I'm submitting. So, whoa, I'm excited. <laughs> but also, um, uh, there were people who kind of um, in the in the previous panel had asked, um, you know, when people say, when people get responses, right, and there may be positive rejections, you know, and it's like, you know, we really love your work, please send more again, we can't include it in this particular issue or whatever. Um, someone was like, do they really mean it? And so uh, let me ask you guys, do you really mean it? <laughs> I do, again, uh, it's so, so, I'm very sensitive, hypersensitive to it because I'm coming to it you know, to the job as a writer and not editor, editor, but writer, editor. And I see myself as a writer first. Um, and sometimes it's just not a good fit. And I try to, you know, stay on top of it by putting it in a folder um, because I, you know, we, we're working several months in advance. So sometimes it's an idea that's not a good fit right now, but it might be, you know, in December. So, um, I do try to revisit those those writers and I have had writers who, you know, we weren't able to run a piece at the time, but three months later we did. And the same thing with the PR agencies too. It, there's just only so much space, whatever the publication is, you just can't, we run, want to run everything and everyone and it's just not possible. Um, and I told you, I really have developed a deep empathy and appreciation for editors everywhere. Uh, including those that I might pitch because uh, it's just, it's a lot of content. And so I'm very cognizant of that and having patience uh, when it comes to reaching out to editors. And it's nothing wrong with sending, you know, a few weeks later, a month later, just a reminder, hey, and those don't upset me at all. And I think that's probably the case for most, for most editors. So do we mean it? Yes! Yes, we mean it! Please! <laughs> That's why I, I like, I, I have, I said it before, I have gotten to the point of literally begging people, please submit <laughs> some more work down the line. It wasn't a fit right now, but I'm, I really want to see more in the future. Um, I, I, I think it, it, it is always shocking to me how few people actually take advantage of that. Now, I'll also offer another example. Years ago was the last time that I was able to give um, uh, detailed feedback, but I hadn't been able to for a, an issue or two and I felt really bad about it. So my offering to everyone um, in, of that like cycle um, was, you know, at sign up for a time with me on at the time, I think it was WebEx or something like that. And I will talk with you through your work for a half an hour. And I offered that to like, I want to say 50 people. It was something like three or four who signed up for it, free, me talking detailed. I, I took copious notes, like, <laughs> and I had offered this time um, and folks didn't take advantage of it. And I was like, wow, this just does not happen. And, and it was only one time that I, I did it. And I was like, this is why I'm doing it. I'm behind on my commentary. Um, and so many people did not. And that's one thing, let alone the folks that I send out, like, please send me more work. And then I don't hear from them for like five years. <laughs> so, um, 
So when, when we say, please submit again, um, we really, really do, do mean it. So I, I hope that folks um, take that as like this, this invitation, this urgent, this push <laughs> to, um, to celebrate that. Because, you know, sometimes a, a rejection can, like any rejection feels like the, the, a devastating rejection and I'm never submitting to them again. Um, but um, especially those rejections that are personalized in any way is something for folks to like hold on to and really think about when is the next submission period and put them at the top of the list to submit again. Yeah, totally. I wonder if like people are like skeptical about or hesitant to take like um, free feedback because it's just like, because the norm in like publishing is just so like, it can be so like clinical or brutal sometimes. So it's like the offer, the idea that like someone would spend time with your writing for free, like is just maybe like, I don't know, it may feel daunting. I wonder if that, I wonder if that's the case too, but I do, I do notice that like people sometimes are a little bit hesitant. And I wonder if it's because the standard is just like so um, cutting sometimes, but I, I also like, I, you know, I think myself and everyone else that I've worked with, like also really, we, I think if you're, if an editor is taking time to say like, please send work, like that's, that like takes extra effort. And that's like something that like, you know, put a lot of thought into. And generally there's a lot of conversation too. Like, like um, when we go through like submission manager, there's like usually copious notes for like that go along with um, like a piece that like we like, couldn't accept at the time, but it's like that we want to see more of that person's work. And so we like try to, if there's any time, like to put together that letter to say like, please send more work is usually like us going through the notes and just being like, how do we, how do we synthesize all this to share so that's the most useful um, for a writer. And so that, that takes a lot of time too. And we wouldn't do that unless, um, unless we really meant it. So um, please, please send work <laughs> again. Um, even if it doesn't get accepted the first time. Can I add one thing, Ramona? Um, was around, um, you know, when, you, when you've gotten that rejection, e even if you've gotten a personalized um, rejection and you submit again, there's no guarantee that that editor, that space will publish you that time, right? And you might get another personalized rejection. And at that point, you might feel like, oh, it's, it's just a form letter. Like, they don't really mean it. Um, that's not true. That's, that's not true. Um, it, it just may be that you met that editor again or that um, group of people at the wrong time to take your work at that time. And if they have asked you again, they really do want to read your work again and build relationship with you. I offer this example. There is um, someone who now has several books um, is like all over the place. She submitted to the Ascentus Review at least eight times, and I rejected her eight times. <laughs> and, and, and asked for work, probably at least six, six of those times. And part of it was like, it just wasn't meeting me at the time. I was also in the space of learning, right? Her, because her work was very different than, um, than what we had published before, what I um, had had experience with before. So I was learning um, and along the way. And I think that sometimes um, the, it, can, it can feel hard on the other end. I, I offer this example because she was incredibly like persistent and knowing that she wanted her work in the Essentials Review. She knew the journal, right? She knew that she wanted her work there um, and was persistent and took it um, on, on trust and faith that when I said, please, I asked, please submit again, she did. Um, and then after that, we have since published her like five times over these years. Um, but I had to learn along the way. And, um, and I, I welcome folks to teach me through their work. That's really great and a perfect segue into the Q&A section of this panel. So there have been some um, questions posted in the Q&A box. And um, so we're going to pull a couple of those out and, um, you know, go from there. So you were talking about um, establishing, more or less establishing relationships with editors. How do writers go about doing that? Because I've actually not heard of this before. So 
this is good for me to do. I mean, reaching out, I, I think so many of us, and I could be taking this for granted, being in a city like LA where, you know, a million writers, um, but so much of it is just your, your own network. Uh, who are the writers that you know, you know, submitting to, who do they have relation, um, editorial relationships with and asking them, asking them if they can make an introduction. Um, I feel like, I don't know, at least 30% of the writers that I've worked with over these last three years have been through introductions. Like I said, I, I do know a lot of writers, so I also brought in writers. Um, going to events, being part, a part of workshops, you know, there's inevitably going to be someone there probably who's a writer, I mean, who's an editor, who has a relationship with an editor. So just really putting yourself out there through workshops, through events, supporting other writers, you know, at, at their presentations, um, and just networking. So one thing that this piece around networking, I think is um, important to pick up. I, I know for myself, I'm really awkward sometimes. <laughs> like, um, and it strikes at the most inopportune time, right? Like I really want to be a fan about this person and I just, I just fritz out. Like, so I, I totally, uh, for those of you who are like me, <laughs> there are other ways that you can make um, connections and also know that if you totally fix out in one instance, it's not going to be the last time that you ever like can talk to that person in one way or another. Um, so just send an email, just send a tweet, um, connect with a personal social because that can be something to help you make connections initially. Um, also workshops. Um, I, I do a lot of workshops um, on online uh, with Speakeasy now with um, the SF Writers Grotto um, and whatever the workshop is, if if the um, if the leader of that uh, workshop offers uh, the ability to like sit with them for a little bit, like I do um, consults, individual consults, um, a question to ask is how do I build a relationship with with um, editors, <laughs> or where can you see my work being published? Um, uh, like because then you're taking advantage of their knowledge set uh, of who's publishing what, right, and their understanding of your work. Or um, do you have any um, folks that um, might be able to lead me in this particular um, direction, whether it's a, a manuscript or organizing or like whatever your question is, ask it. Um, the, you know, somebody can say, I don't know anything about that, <laughs> but maybe I know somebody who does, right? So maybe that's helpful. Yeah, I think I think everything that everyone said so far, like um, being part of, um, I think all of us have done some variations of like of other programming, like events, workshops, um, readings. Those are great ways to introduce yourselves to editors. Um, and I also think like, I don't know, like networking, I'm also very, um, can be very like shy around networking events. Um, I think like, I'm not even entirely sure how that would work. And our current pandemic <laughs> times. Um, I don't know if the internet will facilitate even like smoother social transactions, but I think I think the key thing is like to not think of it as something transactional, but just like you're curious, right? You're curious about the work that everyone's doing. You're curious about the work that appears. You're curious about process. I think that curiosity, I think like creates more room for conversation than something that feels transactional. Like I'm gonna send this email and they're gonna know my name. It's like, well, it's like, we want to know you too. So like, how do we do that authentically, you know? Yeah. That's fantastic. Great answers um, and super, super helpful. Um, so one of the other questions we have are about uh, cover letters. Um, how important are they? And what's the best approach to a cover letter? I'm a little bit different. I'm not a literary journal with a literary journal. It's a magazine. So the more concise, the better, uh, because yeah, the more concise, the better. So just a couple of lines introducing the topic if it's not an already written piece so that I can go through it quickly um, is way more preferable than a full cover letter. 
Yeah, for me, the cover letter is a, is a space for um, the, what I asked for, which is the, like, what being let, let the next means for me. That, that statement, the um, third person bio, which makes my life much easier down the line when I'm doing what the, the website, um, even though I change things. But anyway, um, that's important to include. So following the submission guidelines. Um, I don't, I agree with um, Cassandra of, of like, do I want something extremely long? Nah, you don't have to tell me that you've read like the last 15 issues and you really like that one poem or that one line. Like, I would love you to do that. Please do that. <laughs> but you don't have to mention it in your cover letter. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think basic information, the bio is really good. Um, the names of pieces, you want to give some context to what you're sending. Like if it's a piece that like is inspired by certain events and we need to know what that event is. This is not directly named. It would help us just do a little bit more research on our end. Um, and I personally, I personally like like um, people who share a little bit in their bio. Like you know, you have your professional publication bio, but then it's like if you're a teacher, if you work, um, if you do community oriented work, if you do work towards social justice, and that informs your art. Like that's something that we like. I I know on Apogee we look for because like we're especially like not just interested in publishing people who like have extensive publications. We also want to like uplift people who do a lot of work for their community too. Um, and like maybe are not as widely published. So I, I like personally like knowing that as well. I, I would also add a, a uh -huh. piece around being, if, you're, if you identify as a youth or you found like, um, or if this would be your first publication, I, I love that. <laughs> because I love to tell people, you know, down the line when somebody wins an NEA, we published them first. <laughs> <laughs> and to have that preserved in the bio, I love that. So, <laughs> Well, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, we're here at the two o'clock mark. And um, there's another, I know, just when my thing started working. Okay, but <laughs> so I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank, um, you. thank you so much to women who submit, um, to Lauren, our tech goddess today, for Sochi, for organizing everything and all of it. Thank you so much to our panelists. And um, yeah, again, go to the Women Who Submit uh, Facebook page um, on September 5th, because that's when we'll be dropping all of the, um, the, the order of the journals that are coming out in terms of top tiering. Um, for, for our submission blitz, which is happening November, I'm sorry, September 12th. <laughs> um, and yeah, so all that information is available on Facebook and will probably be tweeted uh, via Twitter. So follow, 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 and follow all these lovely people here. Submit, submit, submit to their journals. And um, again, thank you so much. I don't know if Lauren wants to say anything else, but I am very happy to have been able to host. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ramona, for hosting. Thank you to our panelists, Cassandra, Muriel, and Reina, and Sochi for organizing this. I do want to give one last plug to Accolades, the Women Who Submit anthology that we published. You can find Cassandra in here as well as Muriel. And, um, and it's available on a link that I am posting right now in the chat. Um, and Thank you all so much for joining us. We're sorry we didn't get to all of the questions from the audience, but everyone and women who are available for questions and um, you can write to all of our lovely panelists and um, yes, keep building relationships with editors. Yay. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much.